All right, welcome back everybody to our second lecture on BC212 Christian Apologetics for this week. Thank you for being on the class. Um, does anybody have any questions so far on what we were saying on the third piece of our framework on understanding suffering, which is that Satan himself, the devil and his demons are at work <clears throat> oppressing people, causing harm to people. And we were looking at the specific uh, situation, a case of Job, uh, where Job experienced uh, a lot of calamities in his life. His workers or people he employed were being affected, his family was affected, his possessions were affected and then eventually his own health was affected and uh, we see clearly in Job 1 and 2 chapters 1 and 2 that is Satan went and caused these things it wasn't God causing it Satan was causing it but what we explained in the earlier lecture was Job didn't have that understanding that you know that it wasn't God and Satan was causing this and the good thing was that Job didn't blame God. He never charged God and he never sinned against God, even though his understanding was not clear or correct at that time. What we do see is that Job had a fear, a very strong fear, that such calamities would happen. And when it did happen, he confessed, he acknowledged, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me and what I dreaded has happened to me. So somehow he carried this fear in him, and the fear fear opened the door uh, into his life. So any questions, thoughts on that so far on Job? We'll look at another case of the Apostle Paul, Thorn in the Flesh, but before we change, any questions? Okay. Let's uh, go back to the notes. Feel free to ask questions anytime. Everyone is very quiet today. I um, hope you're following me. Let's, you know, in continuing on this second thought that the devil does evil things, we will look at another case in the Bible that is of Apostle Paul. Now, again, Paul in the New Testament <clears throat> is a God fearing, God loving man, just like Job. Paul was the great apostle, he was serving God. Right? And yet we see something in his life that, uh, that's, uh, that, that we need to understand correctly. So we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and um, we will, you know, we will just, we will read verses 7 to 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we will read verses 7 to 10. Could somebody read that for us, please? Second Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Mm. And I, and lest I should be exalted above measures by the abundance of the revelations, a throne in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with God three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weaknesses. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in the infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Mm. I have become a fool yeah. in boasting. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. So, Paul is sharing something from his personal life, his own experience. Let's look at it very carefully. Look at verse 7. 
He says, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. So he said, you know, so Paul is acknowledging that he had been given so much of revelation by God, which of, co of course is seen for us uh, in all the epistles that he has written. Uh, he explains so much of, of spiritual truth. Plus Paul himself had uh, was caught up into the third heavens. Uh, he encountered God and the Lord in so many so powerful ways. So he says, you know, lest I should be exalted or that I should be puffed up, become proud. There was given to me by the abundance of a thorn in the flesh was given to me, and a mess this is a messenger of Satan. So a thorn in the flesh was given to me. That means he's using a a, a phrase um, a thorn in the flesh, just like in you know. So that of course, it's been translated in English, and you know, we would use similar phrases. You know, like like for example, we would say a you know so somebody is such a pain in the neck, or uh, somebody is such uh, an irritating person, whatever you know. So we use those kind that language. It's just a form and structure of the language, but and it's not taken literally it doesn't mean there was actually a physical thorn in his flesh but it's he's using a phrase and then he tells us what that thorn in the flesh is actually what was it he says a messenger of satan so what was this thorn in the flesh that paul was referring to it was not some sickness or disease in his body it was actually an angelic being, a messenger of Satan. So a messenger of Satan is a demonic being, and you know, whether it was uh, a, a, an, an individual demonic spirit or a group of demonic spirits, whatever, it basically is saying these were Satan's spirit, Satan's angels, messengers of Satan. And they, what were they doing? They were buffeting him. That means they were beating or repeatedly coming against him over and over and over again. So what I want, what I want to point out from verse 7 is this. It is very clear here that these messengers, angelos, or evil spirits of Satan, were what Paul was referring to as a thorn in the flesh. There is no ambiguity on what this thorn in the flesh was. So we should not speculate. It is wrong for us to say the thorn in the flesh was some sickness or some disease. No, no. The thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan, a demonic spirit of Satan sent by the devil. Doing what? Buffeting, coming over and over again, repeatedly coming against Paul in his ministry, in what he was doing. So Paul calls this thing, which God permitted, of course, God permitted, God allowed, because like we said earlier, right now, Satan and his demons are permitted by God to operate on the earth. And so God permitted this messenger of Satan to keep coming against the devil, against Paul. And so in that sense, it, it was allowed, it was permitted, as in, a, it's as in being permitted to trouble every human person. Now these spirits focused on Paul, kept coming back against him over and over again. And the specific reason, or, 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 or Paul saw it in this, this way, that he, he, Paul had received so much of revelation, so much of you know, spiritual encounters with God, that this thing helped keep his feet on the ground, so to speak, so kept him from being getting puffed up in his mind. So Paul saw a good, a positive outcome of this messenger of Satan coming against him over and over again. That you know, hey, this is keeping my helping keep my feet on the ground. This is helping me stay humble. 
lest I be exalted above measure because of all the revelation given to me. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that we, it would be very incorrect for any believer to say that they have such a similar, they have a similar kind of designated evil spirits against them. Why would it be incorrect to say it? Say so, because no other believer, no one we know of on the earth today, has been given such revelation as the Apostle Paul. Right? Paul was very unique in the sense he was chosen to be an apostle, and God gave him so much of revelation, which today comprises about two thirds of the New Testament. So nobody else can say, I'm in the place, I'm in that same kind of a position as the Apostle Paul. So therefore, for some any believer to say, hey, I have a thorn in the flesh, like Paul, is a little out of place, because nobody has been given that kind of revelation. So you and I don't need to worry about having a thorn in the flesh, demonic spirits, a messenger of Satan, dedicated to attacking us and coming against us. Don't worry about it. We are not in the same place as the Apostle Paul. Okay, That's a side note. But going back to what Paul was experiencing, we can see that demonic spirits do try to hinder and oppose the work of the ministry. They try to, in general, generally speaking, they come, they try to attack, they try to interfere, they try to intrude, they try to uh, disturb, they try to hinder God's people. And Paul was experiencing that in a heightened manner, uh, in a manner that we don't have to worry about because we're not in that same place of receiving abundance of revelations. And in that context, Paul is praying. He asks the Lord, he says, God, Three times he says in verse eight, and I pleaded the Lord, God, ah, can you get take, can you take this off? Can you get rid of this? I, I don't want this. De let this depart from me. Now let these this messenger of Satan is repeatedly coming against me. God, let him be taken out of the way. And God's response is, and it'll be the same response for you and me. Is it's not about getting you know taking the devil out of the way. Because as long as we are on this earth, there will be evil spirits to contend with. That's what the Bible tells us. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the devil. That means it's not like God is going to take the devil away forever. No. As long as we are on this earth, we're going to face it. There will come a time in the future, Revelation chapter 20, when Satan will be, Satan and his demons will be permanently removed off the earth. That is at the end of the now, uh, the millennial reign of Christ. But until that time, Satan and his demons are operating. So we can't just say, God, let this depart from me. We're going to face it. But what God was telling Paul is, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. So I'm not going to take the devil out of the way. I'm going to empower you with my grace to overcome. Right. So the devil and his demons are operating on the earth. They are attacking, they are hindering, and they're doing what they have to do. But like Paul, we are empowered by grace, by the grace of God, to overcome. In other words, let the devil do what he's going to do, but he's not going to prevail in his assignment. You can overcome. You can continue on. You can fulfill your work. And so that's exactly what happened in the case of Paul. God empowered him by his grace, and at the end of his life, Paul says, I have fought a good fight, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. In other words, this messenger of Satan didn't prevent Paul from finishing what he had to do. He finished it, and he says, I'm ready to go. Right. So, in view of that, Paul says, hey, when I feel weak, when I face all these things, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to rejoice. Why? Because his strength is made perfect even when I feel weak. His grace is sufficient for me. That's all I need. His empowering work in my life is going to put me over whatever I face.
right? So that's a lesson we can take that in our in the midst of our weaknesses, in the midst of where we feel weak, where the enemy may be attacking, the power of Christ is being made manifest. The power of God is being revealed in and through our lives, right? So he, you and I can take that lesson uh, from Paul's experience, right? So the enemy is operating on the earth. Uh, he's been permitted to carry on his work. So there's no point in saying, you know, God, take him out of the way. No, he's, he's around there, but we are going to overcome by the enabling of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God in our lives, we are going to overcome. So there will be battles. The, ba the, the enemy is not going to stop fighting his fiery darts, but we, by faith, overcome and continue on in the purpose of God for our lives. So God has given us his anointing. He's shown us how to you know, overcome the enemy. And uh, he's given us his weapons. Uh, so we continue uh, pressing forward. Okay? Now, the devil uh, will try to attack us in various ways. So whether it's sickness or disease or other situations in life where the enemy tries to operate, but we need, using what God has given to us, we overcome. We, we, um, you know, we overthrow the works of the devil in various areas. We, we can come out victorious. So what must we do? We must discern by the Spirit of God what the enemy is doing. We exercise a God-given authority to resist and overcome Satan's works. We don't quit. You know, we endure, we stand firm. And uh, uh, we don't, we shouldn't blame God for what the devil does, right? So the enemy's coming against us. Okay, don't blame God for it. God's given us the victory. Christ has conquered the enemy for us. And he wants us to walk in his finished work, right? So uh, we must stand firm in faith and resist the devil, right? God has instructed us to resist the devil, and God's not going to do that for us. So, um, we, you know, we shouldn't be uh, uh, thinking that we are at the mercy of the devil. No, we, are, we should be equipped with the word of God. We contend against the devil. We overcome the devil. And we walk in victory or whatever he's doing. We can live victoriously. Okay. So that's the third piece to this framework i want to pause here and and, and and just get us to think about this you know so why do people face challenges difficulties evil because there's an enemy that comes to steal kill and destroy so believers will face these things and we saw the example of job and paul when we face what the enemy is doing we shouldn't blame God, because God has already done what He, whatever He can do. He sent Jesus to conquer the enemy on our behalf, and then He gave us weapons, He gave us His Word, He gave us His name, He gave us His Holy Spirit, and God said, okay, now with what I've given you, you live victoriously over the enemy. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Go on, you know, keep fighting the good fight. But if a believer does not engage the enemy the way God wants us to engage, that's when we see in the life of a believer, we see the enemy inflicting harm, inflicting pain, causing things to happen. And then it's difficult for us, right? Why is a good person, a good believer suffering like this? But God has given us what we need to stand up and fight and overcome. So we need to equip believers. We need to encourage believers. We need to stand together with believers and say, hey, we can overcome. You know, we can conquer and, 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 and you know, journey into victory, uh, even though there may be battles 
along the way. Any questions on this third point? Everybody following along? Okay. That's fine. You have a question, Elisha? Or you're okay, following. Okay. All right. So let's move forward to our fourth point, fourth piece of this framework, and trying to understand suffering. So, you know, when we see believers, so God's people um, face challenges. We need to understand, okay, are they facing these problems because of their own actions? Are they facing these problems because, yeah, it's the enemy coming against them? Or are they facing these problems because, look, there is corruption in this world, and uh, what happened to them is not because of the enemy, not because of their own actions, but there is this decay there is this deviation from god's design and now let's over there we have to pray for a miracle if it is what the enemy is doing then we need to stand up against the enemy and fight and put that down if it's their own actions then you know we need to just sit down with them and talk to them and help them you know take the necessary action to remedy the situation right now, the fourth area, or for the fourth piece of the framework, why sufferings happen is because other people do things. So we must acknowledge or we must recognize that we are in a world where there are people around us who are wicked, who are sinful, and out of their wickedness and evil intents, they do harm to other people. So we may call it persecution when it is directed towards us because of our faith. Sometimes it's just plain jealousy and um, competition and all kinds of things. So when that is happening, and we, uh, you know, we shouldn't blame God again. We can't blame God for the actions of other people. They are doing it, you know. And and this can happen on different levels. You know, it it, it can happen at a personal level or in a in in a government situation. You know, one nation decides to go to war against another. Why? Because you know the leader there, one nation decided he's going to go out there and kill people, or he wants to take over territory, or you know, like what we see happening. With Russia, Ukraine, so on. So you, know, you have that all around the world. People are doing things for whatever gain they might perceive. And uh, they, 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 they don't mind doing evil things to other people in order to achieve what they want. And we cannot uh, ascribe those actions to God, right? And so in first Peter chapter one, so basically first Peter, first and second Peter is written to uh, believers who've been scattered around, um, mainly Jewish believers. Peter's writing to the Jewish believers who've been scattered um, across um, Asia Minor, that, that around that area. And he is trying to encourage them recognizing that they are facing persecution, facing hardship, just because they are being dispersed and they are people of faith. Right? So he's recognizing that. And so he encourages them. He says, you know, for a little while, that means this is a short, you're going through this, I understand. And yeah, he says your faith is being tried, tried and you are you know, being grieved and you're going through various trials and adversity. But this only is serving to show that your faith is very genuine. It's not uh, some fancy that you're holding on to, but you have true, genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that you will receive praise and glory when the Lord comes. Right. So, uh, in his episode in First Peter, 
you find you know he's actually very very systematically addressing all the various issues or sorry various areas of trials various areas of suffering these dispersed Jewish believers are facing they have been displaced uh, from uh, Jerusalem uh, they are uh, living outside of their own you know normal place and, and they have to try to make it you know whether it's in they have to try to get a job they have to try to live amongst people who are hostile uh, they have to face all kinds of ridicule and persecution so he's identifying and and, and i've just kind of put this list down here uh, and you will find this in 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 first peter so he says uh some of them are suffering wrongfully in the workplace now all remember all this is because they are believers you know, they are believers and because they are believers they're facing all this uh, they may suffer wrongfully in the workplace people are you know humiliating them ill treating them simply because they're believers secondly they may face suffering for righteousness sake that means they are doing what is right but their right actions are being accused or being held against them they, they are being accused for their good conduct so it's not that they are doing something wrong they're doing what's right but that good conduct is being held against them you know they, 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 that suffering for righteousness sake then there is suffering against sin he talks about this so you know they're in this world where people around them don't care they're living uh, sinful lives unclean lives and so that is putting pressure on the believers and so Peter identifies that he says you know you're suffering you're striving against sin and the Gentiles around you the unbelievers around you are wondering why you're not indulging in sin but you are standing firm and it's part of the suffering then he also talks about suffering as a Christian they're bearing the name of Christ and therefore they're, they're being ridiculed and so on and he, he calls that suffering as a Christian or even sharing in Christ's sufferings and think about that it's 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 such an honorable thing that when you suffer as a Christian that is your suffering for Christ it's your suffering with Christ you're suffering as a Christian and then he 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 tells them in, in in chapter four verse fifteen. I don't want you to suffer for your own actions. I mean, it's for your wrongdoing. So, in other words, he's saying, you know, don't get into wrongdoing, because if you suffer for your own actions, then you're just getting what you deserve, right? So don't suffer for doing wrongs. So and stay away from doing wrong. Don't suffer for your own actions. And in chapter five, First Peter five eight and nine, he identifies another area of suffering which is suffering because of the adversary the devil who walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour so here this is the enemy satan himself uh, that uh, satan is demonic powers themselves going against the devil all right so what we're seeing is as believers living in a world that doesn't care about god in a world that is evil and wicked there could be many areas where we're going to face suffering, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's because of our good conduct, whether it's our striving against sin, whether it's because we bear the name of Christ, uh, and hopefully it will not be because of our wrong actions. And number six, uh, there is the enemy who comes against us, and we should be firm in our faith to... Uh, to stand against the enemy to counter his uh, uh, his his maneuvers so what we're seeing is that you know there are at least three areas where it could be other people directing their actions against the believer right so we are suffering because other people are against us because of our faith so that's um, uh, that's something to keep in mind. There's a reason why people face suffering. So, example, you know, we would hear 
you know, think about a believer who uh, is facing difficulty in the workplace. It's be and it's being directed against him or her because of their faith or because of their righteousness. They're unwilling to compromise on integrity and dis uh, and honesty. But, you know, the manager or supervisor, whoever wants them to do something wrong, and they say, sorry, I cannot do it. And then the person begins to retaliate, begins to, you know, unnecessarily, you know, make accusations, so on and so forth. So what are, what's happening? They're suffering for righteousness sake. Right? Or sometimes they suffer because they bear the name of Christ. They are Christian and, you know, they may suffer. So like this, you can think of many scenarios where the suffering that a person is enduring is because of the actions of others. Or if you want to look at it in a very general sense, you know, when if you think about war, so many people are suffering. They're innocent people. They have not done anything wrong, but they are suffering because some other leader or some other nation and their people are doing evil, are doing things that are wrong, and so they're suffering. Right? So this is the fourth reason why there is pain and suffering in this world. It's because people do evil to others. Right? So what should our response be? Right. One is, of course, we can pray um, that God will move upon people and influence them. You know, so you pray uh, whether it's in a, in a in a personal situation. You know, so God, I pray for you know whoever is doing harm and evil, that God you would move on that person, you would change their heart, change their mind. So we want God to influence them. Of course, the the final decision is still theirs, but at least God can move upon them. To influence them and second then we also learn from first Peter that regardless of what people do we should continue to live like Christ keep a heart full of faith toward God and keep a heart free from anger or bitterness towards the people who are doing evil against us in fact Jesus told us he said you know pray for those who despitefully use you and uh, ill treat you and you pray for them so even when people are against us, we, we pray for them. Uh, we believe in God that you know He can turn things around. What people may intend for evil, God can turn it out, turn it around for good. And um, and rather than becoming persecution minded, we we say that you know God will protect us. Now, be more conscious of God's protection over your life than man's persecution against you. You know, we trust in God, and we, of course, keep our eyes on the eternal reward. Okay, keep our eyes towards that. Now, in connection with this, there's a quite a difficult question. I'm not sure, you know, I have a convincing answer to this, but let's try to just think about it. The difficult question is, why is it that some believers are divinely protected and why is it that some believers die being persecuted you know and we, we hear both kinds of stories and testimonies we hear of testimonies where you know uh, believers were about to be attacked uh, physically but God divinely protected them something happened and you know God protected them and then on the other hand, we also hear stories of uh, incidents where believers are killed. They die, they suffer. So why is it that in some cases people are protected, believers are protected from the evil actions of other people? And why is it in some cases uh, that doesn't happen? Why is it that way? And like I said, I I don't have a, a complete answer. I don't have a complete answer. But what I would recommend, um, and personally, this is how I, I try to live, is that I try to keep my faith in God's protection. Right? That the scriptures, you know, for example, 
Isaiah 54, 17. You know, no weapon formed against me will prosper. Or Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around me, delivers me. First Chronicles 16, I think it's verse 29, um, um, where it says, you know, that the eyes of the Lord are over, uh, run to and fro. He shows himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is devoted towards him. Right? So I try to keep my eyes and my faith on those scriptures of, scriptures of divine protection. And I expect to be divinely protected, right? So that's how I position myself. God will protect me. Right? Now, why is it in uh, I, you know, in in some cases, believers suffer and die? I don't know. I don't want to speculate. Uh, I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to speak on something I don't understand. Um, but uh, I just position, position myself saying, God, I trust that you will protect me. And I'm expecting divine protection over my life. I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to believe you for it. And uh, even if there is any harm done, we are determined to maintain our faith in God. Right? Now, we will, like we see in Scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, there are people who were killed, who were, who were you know, like Hebrews 11 says, they were sawn asunder, they were killed for their faith. And so we know that God honors that, you know. Um, the Bible tells us here, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. So God honors that. God sees that. Although I don't have, you know, we don't have a complete answer as to why did God not protect them from being killed or from being physically harmed? Why didn't that happen? I don't know. I don't want to, you know, speculate, but we stand with them knowing that it's precious in the eyes of the Lord. Okay. So let me pause here. Uh, number four, we understand this, that there is evil because of other people's actions. Uh, the scriptures give us instruction on how to respond in those situations. Uh, what is the attitude we must have? And uh, I close off by saying, look, uh, we don't always have an answer as to why uh, some people experience divine protection and some believers, you know, suffer. Uh, we don't have an answer, but we honor everyone who suffers for the name of Christ. Let's pause here and see if there are any questions, anything we would like to discuss. Any questions on this? Any thoughts? Any questions? Okay. Yeah. So this whole, you know, area where uh, believers suffer. Now, sometimes, and let me, you know, what we see is that when believers do something wrong, then people come back and they use it hard against them. So, if a believer, you know, uh, is not handling money properly, example, I'm just giving example, he mismanages his money, and then the people come against them, you know, uh, very hard, using that as an excuse. Ah, oh, you mismanaged money, therefore we... So the, the, the harshness is double. One is because the believer was irresponsible in the sense of they mismanaged money, that, that's, that's the case. 
but then people combine it with hey I'm going to be hard on you because you're also uh, a believer I'm going to you know so we see that complicated situations also uh, and that's why in this world as believers we should be twice as careful twice as wise when we deal with you know in in the matters of life so be doubly careful because one is of course we want to do everything right and plus if we do something wrong the unbelievers will use that as an opportunity to be doubly harsh against us one is by default they are against those who name the name of Christ but then it makes matters worse when we do something that are wrong that is wrong uh, which gives a pretext for being harsh so in such a situation we have to tell the believer to right the wrong that is hey take responsibility for your action now don't just say I'm being persecuted yes there may be an element of persecution here but remember it all started because of some wrong action in this case and the example that I said they were you mishandled money so don't just blame it all on persecution oh, I'm being persecuted for my faith no take responsibility for your action first that you know you mismanage money that gave them a reason to take action against you so fix that right whatever you did wrong write it make it right and then you're saying God if I'm suffering unfairly because I'm a Christian you know I take responsibility for the wrong I did I'm going to write that anything beyond it now God you vindicate me right you come through for me on that so you know we have to hold things in balance we can't just say entirely I'm being persecuted for my faith when actually the believer has done something wrong has you know mis done something that uh, is not right so you know uh, we have to handle both sides take responsibility for the wrong and then uh, let God intervene for what is real what is actually being uh, uh, what is actually persecution okay so you know and in India I'm just I can speak from what we what we observe for instance is I'll just give a simple example here you know as, as Christian organizations we are supposed to file certain things for the government right um, part of our income part of our income tax proceeding procedure procedures and so on to certain things and plus if there's a Christian organization that has got um, you know what we call here in India as um, permission to receive funds from outside then you have additional filings to be made every year annual reports to be submitted now what we've observed is you know uh, a Christian organization fails to do those statutory filings they fail to report to the government on an annual basis what they're supposed to be reporting they fail to file the reports then when the government comes in and says hey you haven't done what you're supposed to do therefore you know we're removing your permission to receive funds we are shutting you down whatever, whatever. they take action we can't call that as persecution because if you think about it very objectively if that Christian organization had fulfilled their obligations to file those annual reports the government would have no basis to take action everything is in place but what has happened is uh, in many cases our Christian organization have failed to do what was required for, of them to do then the government is taking action and then they go call it persecution and it is not persecution it is 
the garment, just doing what they would do. And they would, it's not just the Christian organization, they treat do the same thing to other non-government organizations who have failed to uh, file those annual reports to do their paperwork. They take the same action against other non-government organizations. So, you know, we, we have to be careful where we clearly recognize, you know, okay, you're facing hardship, you're facing these things, not as a persecution, but because you failed to do something you were required to do. Okay, so uh, I just want us to, you know, be very clear in our minds you know, why there are all these things happening, and 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 uh, you know, ho not blame God for everything. Oh, God is not protecting me, or God is not defending me. No, there is responsibility on our part that we must do in order to be on the right side of things so that we can you know uh, stay away from trouble stay away from these things okay now we have uh, let's say now this is uh, three more uh, sorry two more suffering due to divine discipline and then we also we have suffering due to willing sacrifice which i think i will uh, cover it cover it next uh, week and uh, then we will also talk about in the same context as what should uh, uh, a good response be? You know, when we when we face all these things in this world, what are the reason for the suffering? Yes, whether it's because of the decay of corruption, whether it's because of our own actions, whether it's because of uh, demonic opposition, and whether it's because of what actions of other people. When we, when we face this, okay, how do we respond? What should be our correct reaction? Right. So I want to, you know, next week, we will cover that ground as well. And so hopefully, uh, when we finish up next week, we will have a clear, you know, a clear framework in our mind that, okay, this is why all these things are happening, and this is how I can, you know, how I should respond. And also, when other people, you know, come to us, and they say, "Hey, I'm going through such and such thing. I'm facing this hardship." Then, because we're clear in our minds, we can, you know, help guide them properly. We don't say, "Oh, God is doing it to you," and you know, just accept it. No, we we say, "Okay, this is the real reason why you're facing the hardship, and this is how you can handle it." As a believer, okay, so that will really help us as we work with people. Okay, uh, we were close today. If you have any questions, we will pick it up next week. Um, okay, I see a quick question there from Rosalind Can a pastor receive offerings and tithes in cash and not give the ministry account details to the members? What could be the reason behind this act? Now, uh, generally, generally speaking, I would say no. That means, okay, uh, tithes and offerings, everything has to be accounted for. You know, that's the proper way to do it. So that's why it goes to uh, the church accounts, uh, church bank account. From there, you account for everything, and of course, you pay everybody a salary and so on. So that's a proper way to do it. Now, in some cases, somebody may want to bless the pastor or the preacher directly with a small amount, so they, you know, they tend to give cash to the pastor, the preacher, saying, oh, "Okay, this is your personal gift. Use it however you want." That is okay, right? If somebody gives a personal gift to a preacher, and they say, "Hey, just use it," okay, fine. It's a small thing. Um, but otherwise, what is given towards the church should go to the church account. It should be accounted for, and uh, it from there it should be, uh, you know, all the staff are paid and so on. That's the proper way to do it. Um, now, what I can think of is when when there are small congregations, small churches, 
you know, um, if a pastor is pastoring a congregation of 10, 50 people, 10, 50 people, so on, uh, the offering of things that are coming are not big. So in those cases, I've noticed pastors just collect the money and they just handle it without any proper accounting and so on. Is that a good practice? No, but that's a widespread practice. Uh, it just happens everywhere. Now, they don't get into trouble because the amounts are not big, uh, uh, at least, you know, so. But technically, it's not the right thing to do. The right thing would be have a registered account, a bank account at the name of the trust, and everything happens through the trust. I hope I answered your question. Okay. All right. Okay. So we close for today. Uh, I, I, we're a little over time, so we'll just skip our time of prayer now. Uh, I, I will close the class and you know we can get ready for our next uh, class. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week. We will continue this uh, next Monday. Okay. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.